Ми все нормально, я їх скрив, хорошо. So, I guess it's it. We will start after you are delighted to start our conversation. Yes, so good afternoon to our speakers and to our audience. My name is Arjo Koldemisev. I'm a senior fellow of a Jasper think tank in Ukraine, and I'll be a moderator of today's discussion. Uh, so we will talk about the Nord Stream uh, 2 and its importance for uh, the uh, future <laughs> policy of the United States concerning the victory of Joseph Biden. And today we organized a panel discussion with think tank representatives of the United States and Europe to discuss the future of the Nord Stream 2 in the context of European energy security. We are very honored to have such an incredible panel today, uh, which I will uh, present to our audience right now. So our first speaker today is editor at large of the National Post and senior fellow of Atlantic Council Eurasia Center, Madame Diane Francis. Madame Francis, good afternoon. Good afternoon. I guess it's morning, so it's like- It's morning for me, that's right, yeah. that's right. Okay, do you want me to proceed? Uh, we will present the speakers now and later we will uh, start our discussion. Uh, so our next speaker is a senior fellow of European Council on Foreign Relations, Mr. Gustav Grassel. Good afternoon, Mr. Grassel. Good afternoon. It's so nice to have you today. Uh, and our third speaker is a CEO of Adjustra Think Tank, uh, Mr. Viktor Karvatsky. Mr. Good afternoon. Yeah. So uh, everybody's here. Uh, our audience is ready. They, there are many people who are watching us on Facebook, uh, on YouTube, here in Zoom, and also in other social media platforms. So I think that we'll have a very impactful and fruitful conversation today. Uh, let's wish all of us good luck with that, and uh, we hope that everybody will like that. So let's start from our first question of today's conversation. Um, how Biden administration will change and how it should change its policy towards Nord Stream 2? Let's start from Mr. Karvatsky now, and uh, later we'll move to Mr. Grassel and at the end uh, to Madame Francis. Yeah, okay, thanks Arthur for such an interesting question. So I would like to present how we see it in Eastern Europe, in particular in Ukraine, because our perception of Nord Stream 2 may differ from the perception of Nord Stream 2 from European one or from American one, because for us, it was a matter of national security and the sanctions imposed by American, uh, American Senate have virtually saved the destiny of our gas contract with Russia, which uh, ought to be it ought to exp uh, extend its limits in, the uh, in December of 2019. That it was something unexpected but something very crucial for our security, national security, energy security, and for Ukraine position in the world. So like speaking about how Biden administration will change, will change its approach to our sanctions or should it change its approach? My answer is no. So I'm quite skeptical that something quite like large scale may be changed, why? Because Nord Stream 2, to my mind, is interpreted by representatives of both parties, both Democratic and Republican parties, by various think tanks, by various officials in Trump administration, now in Biden administration, as a matter of utmost importance. So sanctions were introduced by a bill rescuing European energy security. It's more than energetics, it's more than economics, it's a threat perceived as a national security. So despite all the speculations about Biden being a fan of a Green Deal or a Green Transition, 
there are red lines that the president can cross because Nord Stream 2 is much bigger than a the surname of the owner of the Oval Office because it's more than personalities, it's about the power approach. It's about how United States see the power play in Europe how they see their relationships with Russia and how they see the future policy concerning the export of LNG uh, in Europe. So I suggest that maybe the sanction will expand to other sectors like the other subcontractors uh, or law firms offering their help to uh, many, many companies in this North Stream 2 group in uh, affiliated companies with Gazprom, etc., etc. So I'm quite skeptical that the, we will see some change. So that we will see a uh, Biden policy centered on the ways and in order to restore transatlantic ties, in order to restore the relations with Germany, they would sacrifice such important issues as North Stream 2. Because for them, it's more than just economical project. It's more about the desire of American companies willing to export LNG in Europe. It's a part of national security and part of a much larger power play having the place in Europe. So like energy is perceived in Russia as a weapon. So from the economic point of view, speaking about, for example, our gas uh, transit between Ukraine and Russia, if it was just an economic deal, we wouldn't have needed the help of the United States. But Russia perceives it as a political weapon. So in this game, in, in which rules are set, I guess, by Vladimir Putin and by senior fellows of administration of Vladimir Putin, United States are forced to play in this game. And speaking about how it should change, so like being an egoistic person, like a person representing a country which is odds in Russia right now, we in Ukraine support uh, aggressive, more aggressive politics when it, games, when it comes to energy security. So we're opting for more American presence in Europe <laughs> in terms of LNG terminals, in terms of new contracts, in terms of new and more export of the LNG to Europe. Because we have been struck by this feeling of being a neighbor of a monopoly exporter of natural gas, of being a victim of uh, like take or pay contracts during our like 10 or 15 years. That's why I guess the more uh, willingness administration Biden shows to counter Russia, the more it would be better for Ukraine. But reverting to the question, would it change? I'm quite skeptical of this fact because I think that no matter how much Biden would like to restore transatlantic ties, Nord Stream 2, at least now, at least in 2000. 2020, it is something that is more important than his wishes or his plans. Thank you, Mr. Karvatsky, for that response. Mr. Gressel, what do you have to add to that question? Well, not much. So I also don't think that in substance uh, a lot will change because it, the corresponding bills have wide support amongst both parties, uh, the tone will change. Trump and Grenell had their sort of certain special spleen to sell this stuff. Um, and this special spleen was utterly unwelcome in Europe and made it actually easy for the proponents of Nord Stream 2 to climb, kind of claim the sovereign high ground of defending the German energy market against these bad Grenells and Trumps. And that will be gone. Uh, with Biden taking over. Uh, the argumentation will focus more on the security aspect than on the economic aspects of the Nord Stream 2. Uh, and Biden will probably ask the Germans for an offset. So uh, the Germans, as you might have noticed, are grumpy at the Americans for buying more, more and more Russian oil. Uh, and this is also a huge revenue for the Kremlin in terms of, uh, in terms of taxation on, on oil exports. 
uh, but uh, the the interesting thing is, or the sort of the easy counter argument made to that is that the Americans in Ukraine, by military training, by providing lethal aid, by all sorts of um, other uh, engagement that uh, on intelligence, on the front line, etc., that the Europeans are hesitant to provide or don't provide, and particularly the Germans don't provide, uh, they have sort of offset policies in place that deal with the security implications of uh, the Kremlin getting money through oil deals, which the Germans have not. So uh, the Germans will be asked to kind of answer the question, how do they see the security implications and what do they, will they do about it, which is combined to the issue of defense budgets as well, as well as NATO preparedness, et cetera. And uh, hence the Germans will be on an uncomfortable ground to defending this on multiple fronts. Uh, and of course, the, the sort of tone will be, uh, will be much better. Thank you for your response, Madam Frances. Maybe you would like to add something insightful to that too. Well, I, I agree with uh, the terrific statements of both my predecessor speakers. I just wanted to sort of uh, fortify the position and there will be absolutely no change in the United States under a Biden regime concerning Nord Stream 2 whatsoever. There will be no concessions given to Germany to play nice with Germany as over Nord Stream. Uh, as I've written for years, Nord Stream pipeline is not a pipeline, it's a weapon. And it's dependent and the dependency of Europe is at stake. The United States, this is not a commercial deal. Uh, this is helping Europe save itself from its own incompetence in keeping Gazprom out of the gas market in such a, you know, proportion. Gazprom has been a very uh, has has been a very unsavory participant in the energy market in Europe. It is, you know, uh, played fast and loose with supplies. It has fooled around with prices. It has flouted the laws and restrictions. It can promise that it's going to decouple the ownership of the gas from the ownership of pipelines that take it in Europe, but nobody can believe what Gazprom promises. There's many lawsuits to show that it has a track record of not keeping promises and not obeying laws. So we're talking about allow, allowing a nefarious player to come in and dominate the gas market in a very important part of the world, Europe. And there are other suppliers. I mean, the United States isn't going to be you know, licking their lips that they're going to get all this LNG business. That's not going to happen. Uh, what's going to happen is, you know, Norway is gearing up, uh, Qatar is gearing up. And, you know, let's not forget the fact that the Turks have discovered huge amounts of gas in the Black Sea, the Israelis have. And, and furthermore, there's a lot of gas in, in Ukraine itself, which has been blocked from being developed for a number of reasons by oligarchs who are friendly to the Russians. So, you know, we've got a situation where this is not anything that's a bargaining chip. This is just a very crazy deal. It is a very destructive deal for Europe and the Americans know it. And as uh, Mr. Gessel referred to, this is a bipartisan um, event. This is uh, something both parties, both houses of Congress and Trump as well as Biden have agreed on. I mean, Trump signed the, the latest sanctions, which are very tough. And there's another bunch of sanctions in the Defense Act that we'll see whether he signs or not. He's trying to hold off. But, you know, Ted Cruz remains a very important leader, a Republican leader in the Senate. And this is his baby. And he's not going to let go of this at all. So it is strategic, not commercial. It is permanent, not not a bargaining chip. Uh, it is also another concern for NATO. Uh, this is something that isn't written about a great deal. Not only will Gazprom dominate energy markets and start to punish countries and reward countries and play all kinds of games in the market internally, but the, the NATO has concerns about the fact that if this piece of undersea Baltic Sea infrastructure is operational, then the Russians will use that as an excuse to have their Navy and their Air Force 
uh, you know, guarding the Baltic Sea, invading, in other words, NATO space and starting to get involved, which will create the possibility for conflicts and confrontations. Uh, and then the last and most important aspect to this pipeline is that by bypassing a perfectly well-run pipeline in Ukraine, there is a military strategic reason for that. And that is simply that without Ukraine's pipeline being necessary, Ukraine be, can be fully invaded by Russia when it feels like doing so in the future, if it ever does. So this is a compelling issue. And it's why, it's why I've been writing about it quite a bit. I understand the oil and gas industry. And, and I, don't, I don't even think this is up for debate anymore. Thank you for your commentary, Madam Frances. Uh, also, I just like to say that our audience members can write their questions to our speakers. And if we have time at the end of our discussion, uh, our speakers will gladly answer to your questions. So you can write them in the chat of this Zoom session or in commentaries to our Facebook and YouTube uh, broadcast uh, and other social media platforms, or even in direct messages of our official accounts in social media. So let's move to the second question uh, that is not less important than the first one. When, if ever, Nord Stream 2 will be constructed and ready for the gas transit. And uh, maybe Madam Frances would like to start a debate on that question. I don't think it will be started. I think it's done. I think these sanctions will be continued and I think they will continue. I think they will do whatever it takes to stop it. And, you know, by the way, Germany may not like it. Of course, Germany wouldn't like it because Russia has made sure that they they're the honeypot. They're going to be the hub. They're going to get all the benefits and the discounts over the rest of their European partners. So, you know, Germany is first among equals in, in this little game that Russia is playing, which is why it's gotten as far as it's gotten. But Germany has to sort of realize that it can't can't defy the requests of its neighbors. Central Europeans, the former satellite Soviet countries, are terrified of this, and and you know they want they want Ukraine to be part of Europe too, uh, and as well, I mean the European Commission voted against Nord Stream, and yet it's it's continued to go forward. So I think the you know I know it sounds extraterritorial, but I think the Americans are waiting in here in a proper way, and it's not just for American interests. There's no LNG of any amount being sold to Europe or will be. But the Americans are waiting in on behalf of Poland and Slovakia and, and all the other countries that are going to be held hostage by the former Russians who controlled them for many years. So um, I don't see them rel relenting on this at all. Thank you, Mr. Gass Grassel. It's your turn now. Um, yeah, so... Well, there are two things, uh, the finishing of the pipeline and the operational use of the pipeline. And probably the first thing will be unavoidable. So it's already 90% built. And basically the, the debate after the Navalny death was the last point at which the, the red plug to the construction could have been pulled and it wasn't. So it will be constructed, that, that seems to be clear. Will it be operational? That's a different matter because um, the first big obstacle is to ensure it. If, if a, a gas pipeline uh, needs to be operational and needs to have the end user certificate, there must be an insurance company that covers for potential risks and hazards stemming from it. Um, and a gas pipeline in a very busy shipping that goes through very busy shipping lanes that has um, that crisscrosses the entry waters of uh, a larger seaport, so Swinimuszcze, the, the uh, Polish uh, seaport close by, uh, that basically is shallow. The Baltic Sea is much shallower than, for example, the Black Sea, where you have similar pipelines. Uh, a lot of things can go wrong. Um, uh, so, and a pipeline can make a big bang if it, 
goes wrong. So you have to you have to come up with quite large amounts of sums to to ensure that, and this cannot be made up of rubles or not entirely up of rubles. So you need dollar or euro currency insurance on the uh, potential hazards of the thing. And here come the weight in the financial sanctions on the matter. So no European insurance company uh, will issue the ticket. Uh, and the Russians won't have the foreign com uh, currency or they're uh, struggling hard to get the foreign currency. They have some handlers in Europe, some minor company, some minor oil and gas companies that sort of try to uh, use asset swaps and traders uh, to, to grant uh, 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 gas from the um, respectful amount of foreign currency, but it's not going so well. So that will be a very lengthy battle and it will be very difficult. Uh, and uh, the difficulties and the delays will have a gas price. So at the end, this plus the new regulations that are waiting in from the EU Commission uh, will make this monster uh, commercially unviable uh, for, uh, for Gazprom and for the dis distributors. So uh, now the pipe is built, it doesn't mean that it will go online. Thank you, Mr. Grassel. Mr. Karvatsky, the floor is yours now. Yeah, so I guess that the pipeline will be constructed and one day it will become a rational one. So it's hard to predict when or whether this day will follow. Because now we're certainly sure that the Biden administration is willing to impose new sanctions, covering insurance and covering underwriting companies. So even if Russians come up with their bold academic Chevsky, when they have tried to use to construct the, the part of the North Stream 2, no European company would insure them or would use them law services or underwriting services. So it will remain as a factor, but for how long? So in Ukraine, I guess we have, or at least we should have, a little bit different perspective about Nord Stream 2 volatility. Because we perfectly see that Americans have said us, have said our gas transit. Otherwise, we, we would enter the new stage of gas war with Russia, and no one knows where it would lead and what, at the time of 2019. So I guess for us, the most important date is 2024. This is the day when our gas transit finishes with, uh, with Russia. So after that, Russia would have no interest in using our gas transport system, the largest in Europe. So like until this point, we need to reinvigorate our imports, our gas imports. So in order to develop this strategy, we should keep in mind that sanctions will not, will not last forever. And we can build our long-term or short-term strategies, just hoping that Americans will be there for us for five or 10 years. So I guess our principal task is to think that after this point, we will be not alone, but this support will not be as crucial as it is today. So I guess we should keep, and we are keeping this point of 2024 in mind to become an, in energy independent, to get gas, for example, from Baltics, from Poland, to uh, join the TANAP initiative. So the South Gas Corridor, exporting gas from Azerbaijan to Italy and to Balkans, maybe even to build LNG terminal uh, at the south of Ukraine. Because now, as we know, like Turkey was declared to be our strategic ally is our, in our national security strategy. So like as st strategic allies, we may come up with some circumstances and come up with some more agreeable terms in order to use uh, in, in order to use like uh, both for a Dardanelles, because the, the crux of the matter, like the talks, the, the talks were reluctant to get us to, trans, to transport LNG, for example. 
So, and I guess if Ukraine keeps this in mind, this gas strategy, we won't be afraid about Nord Stream 2 sanctions disappearing. And we will be ready for the point when the sanction, the sanction will unfold. When would it come? It's um, like a mystery for me. But I guess at some point when uh, Americans would have to reinvigorate their relationship with Germany, because we are not we're speaking about Germany of today, but like uh, what Germany will have in five years, no one will know. Maybe the world will be built in another direction. Maybe the Chinese, Ch Chinese will get more aggressive around the world. So we may be not sure what is will happen in five years, but we, we need to be sure that we should be prepared till this time. Thank you for your responses. Let's move forward to the next question that sounds like this. How do you understand the place of the Nord Stream 2? in the energy competition of the United States and Russia for European markets. So uh, let the Mr. Gressel start uh, this debate this time. Okay, I, I think the, the energy race by US and Russia over the European market is much a kind of Trump, Putin verstehe frame that is fairly inaccurate. Um, the Nord Stream 2 actually will change little in Russia's share on the European market uh, because it will substitute uh, pipeline gas from uh, that goes through Belarus and that goes through specifically Ukraine. So you will substitute Russian pipeline gas with Russian pipeline gas. It, it changed little. Uh, likewise, the American LNG, this is sort of Trump's speech and what the Putin Fashtia clinched on. So this is just the American declaring economic war on us. Um, that's nonsense. Uh, LNG will have its place in Europe, uh, independent from the source. Uh, and in some countries more than in other, uh, there is one restraining factor on LNG in, in, in many countries because of the sea lanes. So LNG is much cheaper and more viable for Spain, for Portugal, for France, because they have unrestricted access, access to the Atlantic Ocean and they can receive much larger vessels. Um, but even small LNG ports in confined waters are useful as a price token. If the, the Germans build small LNG ports because their coastline is cluttered and they have very busy sea lanes. So for security reasons, they can't build big ports. Uh, but they have seen that, for example, also in, in Bulgaria, which through the Turkish Straits can even receive even smaller vessels. Um, still, the, the very limited Bulgarian LNG capacity is a price token you can play against a pipeline provider when they try to come sour on you in pricing. And just the availability of the LNG option, even if it's just to cap peak consumption, is a big asset when you negotiate prices. And that's for many smaller European countries, that will be the first and foremost place where LNG comes in from whatever source. Uh, and this diversification is important. Um, however, uh, the long-term stress, and this is sort of the problem where a lot of murky waters are touched uh, when it comes to the lo long-term energy outlook in Europe, because there, uh, we know that North, North Sea gas is fading out, uh, but there are very, very differentiated uh, tractions on how uh, renewable storage technology uh, will actually change this market because a lot there is, is up to technological progress we can hardly predict now. Uh, this is why uh, a lot of these sort of Gazprom slash German predictions how Nord Stream will kind of substitute North Sea gas is to a certain extent fiction of this state. Thank you, Madam Francis. The floor is yours now. And the question was about American uh, ambition in, in Europe. I, I can uh, repeat the question. Please, yeah. Uh, how do you understand the place of the Nord Stream 2 in the energy competition of the United States and Russia for European markets? Well, I don't think, I don't even think it's a factor. Um, the United States is, 
uh, virtually self-sufficient in um, it, certainly in gas and and to a certain extent in oil. Uh, and as I say, the distances and mean a great deal when you're talking about LNG exports. And the market is tiny for the United States in terms of LNG capacity. Uh, and uh, so I don't, you know, as I say, this is not a commercial, <clears throat> this is not a commercial issue in the United States, despite the fact that Ted Cruz comes from an oil and gas producing state, and he's the champion of the uh, of the of the uh, Nord Stream 2 sanctions. But uh, that that's that's not not inconsistent uh, with with where he comes from. But the Americans have no designs on becoming a big, big energy player in, in Europe whatsoever. And in fact, they're going to at current low prices struggle to maintain self-sufficiency in oil because some of their fracking um, production is not economic at $40 a barrel. So, you know, they use Canada as <clears throat> Canada is their biggest supplier of oil. Uh, it's almost 2 million barrels a day, uh, gas, liquids, and oil. And we've got plenty more of that if they want it. And so I think what you're going to see is pretty much a U.S. Canada self-sufficiency profile <clears throat> with very little upside perceived uh, for any exports for, from either country. Thank you. Mr. Karvatsky, maybe you have something to add. Yeah, so I would like not to underestimate the possible ideas of exporting LNG to Europe because I guess is after the revolution, the second revolution having taken place in the United States, LNG has become a factor to Americans and for its usage and for its export. That's why I guess that we should divide this question in two parallel tracks. So how do Russians see it and how the Americans see it? So I don't, I am not a quite big fan of saying that the oil and gas companies drive the whole offices, drive congressmen, and drive senators. So the United States may have some security interests. And in the framework of security, they perceive the LNG export to make Europe not dependent on Russian gas. But we need to understand that the monopoly is impossible. So like Americans will not be the next Russia. Of course, we have Qatar exports, Algeria exports, I know, Malaysia exports, Australia exports, etc., 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 and like own gas supplies of many countries, for example, like Norway. So the point of United States in Europe is to make those dependent on Russian gas, to make them not so much dependent, to give them the choice to like choose the subcontractor or the contractor and to diversify the economy. But however, these molecules of freedom, as they were called, like a American LNG, have also like a political aspect. Because uh, while saving the Europe or helping the Europe, it's also about cre creating ties, creating more maybe in some form dependency. But I'm not quite sure that it all turns around Russia. It turns about like transatlantic ties, about the perception of Europe in the United States, etc. However, Russians see North Stream 2 or any initiatives which would undermine their monopoly as an existential threat. Because energy is used as a weapon. Is uh, energy is used as a weapon to expand the sphere of privilege interest, to export uh, Russian national interest and to control post-Soviet countries, to control post warsaw bloc countries. That's why I guess in the middle of Ukraine being in the middle of so-called Grand Zhou, like referring to some Afghanistan or Iran situation in the 19th century, may fill the both approach of states and of Russians and we are living in some mix. But I can see as that we will have a monopoly or bipolar system of Russia competing with 
United States because uh, the demand exploses and the production of LNG exploses around the globe. So United States may, may contribute to breaking the Russian monopoly, but they are incapable of installing a new one. Thanks to our speakers for such incredible and insightful responses and analysis. Uh, so we are getting the pile of questions to our speakers and we may start our Q&A session now. So we are choosing the most interesting questions among all uh, that we've we are getting right now. Uh, also, I want to remind to our audience that you can send your questions to the direct messages of our social media accounts, to the comments uh, of our broadcasts in different social media, including Facebook, YouTube, and TikTok even. Uh, and also you can write it in the chat of that Zoom, Zoom session. So we picked uh, the first question out of the pile and it's addressed to Mr. Gressel. Uh, you was mentioning that during one of your responses a little bit, but let's elaborate on, the to on that topic a little bit. And uh, if other speakers will have something to add to your response, uh, we'll give that opportunity to Madam Francis and Mr. Karbatsky after your response. So the question sounds like that. How the poisoning of Alexei Navalny affected the Nord Stream 2 project and why it has such an impact? So um, in Germany, the Navalny poisoning uh, somehow uh, triggered a, a reassessment of the debate that other events did not or to not to the extent. Why that is exactly is something Sigmund Freud could is more posed to analyze than a rational political scientist, but I'll try to give to give a shot. Um, so in 90% of the German-Russia debate is about Germany, not about Russia. Uh, Russia is the focal point of German desires for whatever they think, both in their own country or in Europe, that should be. Uh, and, and this has a past in the 19th century, and this had a present that started with Gorbachev to reemerge and after reunification is actually quite big. Uh, and in that, the inner German debate pays a very high attention to kind of how Russia treats the opposition and how Russia treats the wider rim of civil society and its cultural elites, et cetera. Um, and hence the poisoning of Alexei Navalny touched a specific nerve uh, because it basically, I mean, Experts told that people all the time that Russia is the kind of brutal dictatorship that it is, but general people or not interested people lived in a disbelief of this fact and that shattered their illusions. Uh, the second thing is the Russian response to it by completely denying it, calling into question the German uh, authorities, calling into question the uh, the competence of the Bundeswehr's laboratories to test that. that basically, the Russians had one, two weeks where they just ridiculed the state of um, the current state of Germany and its rule of law system, which that infuriated the other half of the Germans that doesn't have a Russia centric identity debate, uh, which is very proud of the kind of post World War II Germany based on rule of law that they have created. And the Russians directly um, shitstormed that which wasn't to their benefit. Uh, so so this, this created much more seismic noise than the Tiergarten murder or the Bundestag hack or uh, the espion, sort of the technological espionage scandals or the Wirecard thing or any, any other of sort of all these nasty stuff that, that the Russian Federation did to and in Germany uh, for quite some years. Uh, so, so that was 
basically the junk where really Nord Stream 2 was at stake. And it, of course, first was aired by the foreign policy community that now it's time to abandon this. Uh, and for the first time, actually, the chancellery uh, sat down and said, well, we really look into that. And the German oil and gas industry was scared that it might happen. It ultimately didn't, but it was, I think, the, the one and only time where this was really a credible option on the on the desks of, of the politicians. Thank you. Maybe other speakers have something to add to that. Yeah, I, I agree uh, completely. That's a fascinating uh, explanation to sort of bifurcate the two parts of the German psyche as to their Russian uh, outrage, shall we say, uh, over the Navalny poisoning. Um, I was I was shocked that it didn't result in in uh, in the ending of Germany's support for the pipeline. But let's not forget there are huge vested interests that have invested millions and millions of euros in this project, German money and French money, and uh, you know, and it will hand Germany a huge competitive advantage in energy costs vis-a-vis -vis the rest of their partners in Europe. So why don't they, why wouldn't they want to have that, you know, high, that, that edge? And that, that's another issue, I think, that's just absolutely wrong. Uh, when somebody in Texas sells oil in Pennsylvania, they can't charge more except for the cost of transportation and getting it there. So you, you can't have, you know, Germany co-opted or bribed by Russia. So if this pipeline is ever operational, the Europeans have to come up with some kind of um, mechanism where Germany doesn't, uh, you know, get a get a bribe for for being the hub and have an advantage over all the other industrial bases of all the other partners in Europe. And so that also is that's a European issue. That's not an American issue. And goodness knows America has enough of its own problems to sort out. It's a pretty big mess itself. But um, you know, it, it that that is that is a big consideration, and I and I was quite shocked because there was a clear cut. Not to mention, not only did he dump on Germany, but he also accused Navalny of poisoning himself, not making it up, poisoning himself. And this is the kind of distraction and disinformation and and craziness that we've suffered in the United States or the world has suffered because of Trump. He plays the same game. He makes it up and then he comes up with some concoction. And so I was really, really uh, surprised. I think that it's, I, I would like Mr. Gressel to, to comment on this, but I've got to believe that this has permanently damaged any further Russian ambitions to get cozier with, with Germany. I mean, they may say, well, hold our nose this time. We're going to watch you like a, like a hawk. But I've got to believe that that's really impaired any any kind of frayed relationship they have. And of course, at the center of all this is Mr. Schroeder, who's become a multi-billionaire by being a pal of, of Putin's. And he sits on Rosneft and he sits on this Nord Stream board. I mean, this guy is a sellout. He's a sellout. And, and he's the one behind all of the lobbying that's been effective in Germany. So I think Germany has a corruption problem as a result of, uh, such as the US has, and such, such as Britain has with the Brexit and the Russians and France with the French election. Uh, Russians, Russia's a problem for everybody. So I would hope that the, the Germans are, that's going to be, that, that they're more alert and observant and vigilant about all things Russian. Uh, if I may, may add a two finger, yes. Uh, so I actually hear, if you follow the Wirecard scan scandal, so this was a very uh, prestigious German financial transit uh, company, and it's embedded with Russian intelligence service, Iranian sanction busting. Now that the company has come bankrupt, uh, sort of more and more dirty details come to part how this was just a, a, a cover operations for all sorts of subversive nonsense. And it has been under the radar of the German counterintelligence and uh, counterterrorism and counter money laundering investigation uh, agencies all the time. So uh, uh, that is for me the big structural deficit. How can you run such a big corruption ring that, that basically incorporates so many top officials 
without being detected. And, and that's the real thing we, the, the Europeans need to, to definitely act in terms of building capacities and the legal framework to prosecute these people, which is still not there. Uh, and and you saw it's not only us. I mean, it's Danske Bank. You 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 will find you know rotten apples all, all across the continent, unfortunately. Uh, on on the long term German Russian coziness, I think it's it's quite a down. Um, uh, I uh, I'm tending to be a bit cautious on how long this will last because there is a very interesting leadership competition for Merkel Successing coming up in the CDU. And we have one candidate who already has one third of the delegates in his pocket. He's called Amit Laschet, and he is not only an Austrian two fan and an Assad fan, he is basically uh, a uh, reverting German foreign policy to what it had been under Schroeder. So, and if he will claim the CDU leadership, it will be enormously difficult. Uh, but said that, yes, uh, being close to Russia is now a liability. It, had, it has been an asset for, it has been a popular asset for generations of, of post-Cold War German politicians, and now it's a liability again. The German Greens, for example, they feature high in the polls uh, because uh, they are consistent on their criti uh, criticism on authoritarian regimes, so both Erdogan and, uh, and Putin. Uh, and this, this was their liability in, in being popular before, they were called the fundamentalists of human rights, and now people generously across party lines um, uh, agree to their positions. Uh, so it's an asset now, and that that has has changed. Well, let's see how sustainable it is. Yeah, thank you. Uh, what a special dis discussion was sparked by that question, but it's uh, a nice thing uh, to have such a debate uh, about the important issues as this one, because the dialogue can lead to the solution of such problems. Maybe Mr. Karvatsky has something to add to that also. Yes, sure, because we need to understand that the Navalny case is something way of ordinary, because Russians are pressing oppositions between decades, within decades. So we can recall Boris Nemtsov murder right beyond the Kremlin. So it like ta takes 10 minutes from Kremlin to walk to that bridge. And that haven't sparkled such a discussion in Europe. Because we need to understand that Navalny case is a unique one. He was not poisoned by a regular source that you can buy in the store or in the black market. Novichok is a thing which is produced only in secret Russian laboratories and uh, like mortals like us can have access to Novichok. So like all of us are inclined to think that Russians are behind it. It's not like, it's not like Russians some uh, naughty corruptionists having watched the video of Alexei Navalny about uh, their corruption here. No, it's either Putin or some so-called Towers of Kremlin. So the groups which him do trust, so like his closest advisors, like uh, Rotenberg, like chief uh, of his administration, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So like, and while we understand that like Russians are behind that and Russians were so uneager to let Navalny come from Omsk, a little provincial town in Siberia to Charité, that's a huge boom taking place. So as Navalny confessed in an interview to Russian most famous journalist, Yuri Dud, so that his life is a consequence of a chain of happy cash of, of happy chances. So like if something would go wrong, he would be dead now. And this fact that like in Charité he had a conversation with Angela Merkel and the fact that like Russians are treating their oppositional leaders like in medieval times, some uh, Tsars were treating their Un, uh, like unhonest uh, or disloyal member of society is clearly an indicator of something like strong tendencies coming on. 
But however, despite all of these facts that we invoke, like business means business and uh, 11 billion of dollars invested in Nord Stream 2 haven't frozen it. But I guess the most valuable uh, like things that we may get out of this situation is the public perception of German, Germans. Like, so like as Mr. Gressel noted, like Greens are coming up and the like lobbyists, I mean, Lashad, the like lobbyist of Russia has fewer chances to become the next chancellor, or the next representatives of like Eastern Democrats in the next election. So I guess the most important thing Navalny case revealed that it has one more time lowered the like ambitions of Russia to become a friend to Europeans. And it was uh, definitely a huge struck to Russians' reputation in European capitals. Thank you. Uh, it was an, an incredible, a very interesting debate. Thanks for all your comments regarding that topic. Let's move to the next question. We are having one for Madam Francis. Uh, so other countries are also involved in the project. For example, the gas will be transmitted to the Czech Republic, Slovakia, Austria, and Italy through the second pipeline linked to Nord Stream 2. In your opinion, how the cancellation of the project may affect these particular countries and why this pipeline and project are important for them? Well, I don't, I don't know why they're important for them. They're getting served now uh, by the Ukrainian uh, throughput. Uh, and and I, I would also imagine, and I'm not quite sure, but I think Turkstream is pretty much done. The Americans didn't move quickly enough to stop Turkstream, which is another problem. Uh, and Turkstream does serve uh, that low uh, southeast Southeast Europe, or it's going to. So I think it's going to Bulgaria, Greece, Italy, uh, Albania, and those areas. So uh, Nord Stream's uh, sanctions, the, the stoppage of Nord Stream isn't going to affect their supplies through via Turkstream, which is also Russian gas, and or uh, supplies through Russian gas coming out of the Ukrainian system. Yeah, maybe other experts have something to add to that. Uh, I see Mr. Grassel wants to add something to that. Yeah. Yes. So th this was this was on a huge inconsistency of the Trump administration, because actually, the, if you look into the Sanctions Act, uh, it it doesn't specify North Stream two. It means new pipeline projects. The Turk Stream should have been treated the same way as North Stream two. But uh, Trump Erdogan, sort of the buddy friendship, um, prevented a lot of these sanctions from actually, a lot of other Turkey related sanctions as well from actually being implemented. But Trump's rule of law record isn't, isn't the best, unfortunately. Um, no, yes, the problem. So the thing is, actually, Nord Stream 2 is not much about the German energy market. This is also what they try to sell here, but uh, it's not, not really true. Nord Stream 2 should have been operational by now. So we already have distributing contracts to where the gas that Nord Stream 2 would have, should have delivered would go and only 22% are earmarked for Germany, the rest for other countries. And these are, as you mentioned, across the Eugal network, uh, should go to Southeastern Europe because you have the highest spot prices for, for, a natural, uh, for, for natural gas in, in Southeastern Europe. Uh, and this is a pure sort of replacement of the Ukrainian distribution system, which is the Russian aim to substitute the Ukrainian distribution system. That's why they're building it. Uh, and the Germans would sort of earn transport fees, although Gazprom is also has shares in the transport companies. So the German business is not really German at that onset, but okay. And the other spot market is of course, the Netherlands, uh, the United Kingdom and France. Uh, France is on the receiving end of, no, uh, of Dutch gas. Uh, Dutch gas is 
uh, has been the production, uh, the onshore production has been shut down because uh, sort of the gas fills the voids, creates seismic tensions in the in the villages above, and, and it has been declared unsafe. So they had had to shut down gas field, and the, the Scots and Brits um, uh, will face a shortage of North uh, Sea gas uh, soon. So they also want to have uh, uh, gas here. Um, so, so this is this is basically the, the demand North Stream Two tries to tries to fill to some point. Um, on 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 South Eastern Europe, uh, the problem is um, sort of Turk Stream is already mentioned. The problem here is that the distribution network in Southeastern Europe is unfortunately very weak, and the possibilities of reverse flow is weak, and that is a chance for, for pipeline distributors to basically dictate the price because uh, the, the consumer can't choose between alternatives. And here, a lot of Russian corruption has, has sort of run into lawmakers and, and local ministries to kind of defer and delay interconnecting projects and to defer and delay uh, projects that would uh, ensure sort of reverse flow capabilities on these networks. Uh, but here, fortunately, the EU Commission is very active in trying to, to push that down the throat of, of local local authorities. Yeah, so like I agree yeah, yeah. because that like nothing too isn't just about Germany or Central Europe. It's about the Germany have capable of selling the Russian gas technically, German gas to other countries. So it's about like a German strategy of becoming uh, like more important than they, than they are, more powerful than, than they are, exporting gas to their neighbors. So like Russian schemes are also like present, like which were mentioned in, in uh, other parts of Europe, like South Europe, so Dark Stream, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So like, but, I guess like we should keep in, in mind all these like tendencies about the Russians exporting to Europe by UK. We also have still operational pipeline via Poland. So uh, the contract will expire in 2025, but it's already five more years of Uringoy, so so-called Uringoy pipeline Bowen via, via Belarus, via Poland to Europe. And I guess the most important thing to do is to encourage alternatives like uh, South Gas Corridor. So South Gas Corridor, while giving the floor to Azerbaijan, while giving the floor theoretically to some other Central Asian countries which are capable to export the gas via the Caspian Sea, like Turkmenistan or like Iran, having a close like gas relationships with Turkey, and this the south direction should be prioritized right now because we may speak about East Med being an Israeli project like Israelis with Egypt and with Cyprus trying to export gas from like Libya fund, for example, the largest gas uh, founded in recent years in Israel, but it's no match to the amounts that is capable to be exported by the south gas carrier. And now we have tensions between Turkey and between Greece for deciding who is who uh, in the Eastern Mediterranean, for deciding who is like the most powerful player when it comes to EEZ. And when having in mind this tendency is taking place in Eastern Mediterranean, we can't rely on like East Map. And that's why I guess the most primary focus should be devoted to South Gas Rider. And thanks to the possible interconnection system, this gas may be transported to Bulgaria, to Romania, to Ukraine, and to members of Washington uh, groups, group, which may practically substitute the primordial aim of the North Stream. Thank you. So let's move to the third question from our audience, and it's addressed to Mr. Karvatsky. Again, uh, as a tradition, other speakers may add um, some thoughts about that question after his response. So the question sounds like that. German government members say that the urgent and abrupt stop of the project is illegal. 
which legal consequences it may have and why it can lead to many lawsuits against the German government. You know, actually, what the German officials say in this very case doesn't correspond with reality. So if we dig into the third energy package, being the magnum opus of European energy law, and look into the Nord Stream 2, we'll have one very interesting direct. So now we'll speak about it. So like the third energy package was adopted in 2009. It installed a couple of important rules like uh, access for third parties for pipelines that one party like Gazprom can, can use 100% of the pipeline, but it like should use uh, like uh, a half of that and should give the floor to other uh, possible suppliers and gas. One should uh, also disclose all the data about the schemes of the price formation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the most important thing that Ukraine has experienced is this transport system operator should be independent from the company that supplies gas. In Ukraine, we have NAFTA gas holding, and now we have the operator. So could you imagine the Gazprom creating a new entity, a new operator? It causes huge, huge problems. But however, it was, it was the cause for the members of the European Union, or like the members that share the principle of acquis communautaire, the European law. But one uh, good directive, like good for Europeans, for Ukrainians, for Americans, amended the law. And the, uh, this amending gas directive says that the no derogation should be given to Nord Stream 2, because uh, Nord Stream 2 is treated as something finished and the European Commission doesn't regard and doesn't make a difference between almost finished and between finished before like the death day, day it was set to the May of 2019. And that means that the rules of the third energy package should apply to the Nord Stream 2. So no matter what German officials or Russian officials may say, they may try to like have an arbitrage against the European Union. They have failed to have an appeal court about, uh, against the German regulator. So a regulator which regulates the market. And I really don't see chances of Russians like you know, of a Nord Stream 2 AG company winning the arbitrage against the European Union. So when we see this question in the legal frame, we may see that like politics and importance of mitigating Nord Stream problem has influenced a key community. So now, no matter how much like law companies Russian may like buy or may like hire for this case, like a key community should be implemented in any case and it should be applied to Nord Stream 2. So from the legal perspective is perfectly clear and Russians have nothing to say about this. Yeah, thank you. Maybe other uh, members of the panel uh, have something to add. Yeah, Madam Frances, the floor is yours. Gazprom does not obey the laws of any country, nor does, nor does Russia. Russia invaded Ukraine against all international treaties, against the, the, you know, the Budapest Memorandum. They just do what they want to do. They're outlaws. It's a rogue nation. And Gazprom is an extension of the rogue nation. And you just have to look at the litigation, the problems that Gazprom has created. To think that Gazprom is going to obey anything, any of the rules and regulations concerning you know, ownership of the gas and the pipeline and reversible flows and all of that sort of thing is really naive. We are not dealing with a rule of law country. But however, like I would like to like to add, so like Russians may like do what they want, like in Ukraine or in Europe, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. But like as we see, American sanctions have ceased nothing too. European commissions and European bodies have enough power also to like throw the assets of Russian companies of Nord Stream or affiliated companies. So like 
the power of purse may still apply in this way case, I guess. Sanctions, may, may say, I, American sanctions are the only thing that bridles them. Yeah. May, may I add to the, to, to the legal point yeah, of view sure. that there, there are two different things that are treated here. So first this, uh, this the sort of the stopping would be illegal. This referred to the discussion after Navalny that the, the construction permit should be withdrawn or that the German government would order uh, sort of an issue on emergency laws that the construction has to be halted. Uh, and there was sort of the, the legal opinions passed around whether then the German government would be obliged to, um, to pay fines on compensation to the builders and owners of Gazprom. And the overwhelming legal opinion would be yes, they would be sort of, they would be obliged to uh, uh, compensate them in, in a case they shut down the project uh, by force, uh, which, which also was part of the reasoning why the German government didn't. Uh, but the other laws refer to the, uh, to the operation and to the operational side. There was sort of the, uh, I mean, it's Nord Stream 2 does not only have enemies in Eastern Europe, but the Italians, the Bulgarians, they hate this too, the Spaniards hate this too for a, a particular reason. Um, and Nord Stream 2, uh, is an offshore pipeline by and large. So the onshore part, the distribution network, these are different companies than Nord Stream 2. Uh, and the German argumentation was that uh, the offshore part that runs through the exclusive economic zones of European countries, but not on, through the territorial waters and not onshore. Hence, it's, it's something that is outside of the EU and it's outside of the EU jurisdiction and, and hence the delivery contracts and the operational contracts with uh, Gazprom do not have to apply uh, the, the third energy packet. And the Germans have lost every case against that. And basically, uh, sort of, they tried to invent special laws to protect that, and it failed. And it sort of, they, it's, it's a huge legal battle that span across many things. But that's aliens, you know, the Italians were told that. Pactus on Servanda, and you have to keep contracts, and 3% net deficit is 3% net deficit, and you're not allowed to spend more. And then the Germans do something that is beyond the rules of the European community, and that made them huge friends in Rome. Uh, so, uh, because for business, you know, the Italians have nothing against business with the Russians. You know, that's not their argument, but. Um, uh, and, and here, so now Gazprom has to apply this, and yes, they have to. Uh, I mean, it's, uh, some of these questions are hypothetical in, because it's undersea pipelines. So the technical experts of admitting other parties to deliver gas is rather theoretical, uh, but it will have consequences on the pricing scheme because uh, sort of the pricing will be done then on the, on the German part and the pricing has to, has to uh, and the liability and etc. This has to confirm to the, to the energy package, which means that you can find every outcome of this uh, uh, in in European courts, and it's subject to European cartel laws, uh, and that makes it much more difficult to screw customers over for Gazprom. Yeah, so I saw some reactions uh, to. Uh, Mr. Grassel's response, so maybe uh, some me members of the panel have something to add to, to that response also. Uh, if not, then let's move to the next question from the audience. Uh, and it's for all of our speakers today. Uh, so the person who will be ready to talk first uh, may uh, take the floor, take the opportunity and, and start talking. Uh, the question sounds like that. Some scholars agree that this project is not beneficial, too expensive, and even wasteful for Germany. It also doesn't work as a check for Russian actions in the region. Taking all of that into account, in your opinion, why this project is still being important for Germany? Well, I, sitting in Berlin, I think this goes to me. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay. So, uh, well, the thing is, 
when the Germans conceived this project or the German energy companies agreed to this project, uh, they thought this would be an easy cake, which it wasn't. Uh, and at the time they dismissed all criticism that this wouldn't be an easy cake and wouldn't go down as such. Uh, and they thought uh, sort of building the pipeline has certain amount of net cost they could calculate. Uh, they realized that they had uh, for taxation reasons, quite high energy prices in Germany, uh, offsetting this with cheap import gas uh, and the preferred and the perspective of reselling gas at a higher price at even higher priced markets would add benefits to the net balance that compensates for the costs they have endured. Uh, for the energy transition away from nuclear power, which is hugely costly and where they're actually fined to or sued, the, the German government is sued to now to pay compensation fines to the, to the energy companies for shutting prematurely down nuclear power plants and then for, for, for subsidizing uh, renewable energies. So, so that was a sort of business-wise a sound plan. There, is, there was a commercial logic for this stuff back then. The problem is this commercial logic ignores all political aspects that are logically uh, attached to a pipeline project of this magnitude and significance and with so deep security side effects. Uh, so it was a flawed, a flawed conception from the starting point uh, and now they pay the price for an ill-fated uh, and bad management decision. Wow. Yeah, yeah. That's really that's really hard. Impressed. That's that's very hard for a country to climb down from. I mean, I could understand <laughs> the problem. That's why I think Naval, but Navalny for a lot of Germans was just the excuse to get this thing out of the way. Uh, the other the other issue for Germany, which I'm completely sympathetic with, is that uh, I mean Germany's already getting gas presumably from from Russia, correct? Uh, and and so you know they they're already supplied. The problem for Germany is in their renewable scheme, uh, the base load is only served now by very dirty coal and gas from Russia. Uh, that's a problem. And as you get off nuclear and you go to wind and, power, wind and solar does not work because the wind doesn't always blow and the sun doesn't always shine. And so the base load of electrical generation has to be serviced. And what you're doing is you're you're burning this horrible coal you've got, which you have to. And so, you know, as a country that's been at the forefront of going renewable, I think you've hit a wall also in having to say, gee whiz, we're stuck with dirty coal or we're stuck with dirty Russia. And and so, you know, that that's a, that's a huge problem. But it's nothing that the Germans can't think through. And Germany, to me, is the is one of the most successful nations in the world right now. Uh, despite all of that. Um, and, and so I think that's another aspect to it. Um, you know, slowing down your nuclear uh, demobilization, slowing down, you know, speeding up your renewable stuff and all of that uh, is, is, is a better alternative. It may be expensive, but it's not as expensive the mess they're in now because I think they're in a permanent problem. I think they're in a permanent checkmate with the United States over this. And maybe the Germans are happy about that. They can blame the U.S. and they don't have to take the blame for the fact that they made the mistake to do this in the first place. Maybe a very, very nice excuse. Yeah, Mr. Grasso. No, 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 I, I fully concur. Uh, the, the sort of the Americans have been, uh, or Donald Trump, who is much more suited for being the scapegoat for everything evil on the planet, <laughs> uh, uh, has been has been a very willing and uh, and and able scapegoat for 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 the bad management decisions made here. Uh, the problem is uh, for Germany I mean, uh, on the energy front. Uh, I think. At some point, of course, the Germans have been impatient about the, themselves, so especially about reworking their networks. They actually have been better than they have thought to, so maybe the consequences aren't that big. And the second thing is, uh, you know, you implying she sort of energy policy has implied security and problems, uh, but you have other means to deal with security problems. 
and this is sort of the, the second German problem is that with the culture of restraint, with the culture of pacifism that, for example, prevents you from doing the same kind of military training, have a foreign military aid program to, to offset uh, uh, the security risks you're creating energy-wise, uh, uh, you, you can't you can't balance this. I think they they need to go for the offset strategy, like like for example, the Americans buying Russian oil to subsidize Venezuela. Russian oil is not 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 unbloody, uh, well governed oil as well. But there is an American offset strategy that conducts maneuvers in the Baltic countries, that, con that conducts maneuvers in Poland, that trains the mil Ukrainian military, uh, that provides anti-tank guided missiles, et cetera. That's an offset for security problems. And the Germans have to mature themselves that they're living in a pretty nasty world. And this nasty world is made up of a lot of wars and they somehow have to deal with it. Uh, and, and I think this is more viable than reinventing nuclear power because you probably, although there's actually a, a green party internal paper on the wisdom of reinventing nuclear power or for some members of the Green Party, which to me was, it, I mean, technically this lady is perfectly right, but you know, it caused a huge internal shitstorm in that party. So I don't think they will revive nuclear power. And just, um, just on that they, point, they, and, and just on that point, and I think it's very interesting, and I know that I have a lot of German friends and I have a relative that lives in Germany, and this is a debate. Uh, and, and, you know, Trump is just an awful person and he can't, he can't leave fast enough, but in my opinion, but, but the point is that Germany has to pull its weight in NATO, Germany and America can not assume the higher ground and taking control over the security needs of Europe, because it's got 50,000 troops going down in Germany, because it's doing all this the billions of dollars in carrying NATO. So, you know, Germany really can't, as you say, be coddled and protected, and then bite the hand that protects it. Yeah. I, I would like to add to our like, a wonderful discussion by uh, going back to the question and sending on two points. Like now we are living in the reality of 2018, but the North Stream 2 was envisioned to be a success story back in 2010 or 2011. So like they were speaking about that as the next success story of Germany and the next success story of Europe and of like Europe's Germany, let me put it in this way. Because back in 2011, the energy vendor, so the whole going from nuclear to renewables, any form of renewables, was something like not a mystery, but something far more distant. Now we're speaking about the climate neutrality, et cetera, et cetera. But like there was no Paris climate deal uh, like back in 2011. And the green energy wasn't even as serious. And the gas was seen as a possibility like to maybe subsidize some uh, nuclear energy generation to like gas station. And more importantly, to become a hack. So like in terms of speaking about German policy in 2010, 2011, North Stream 2 seemed to be a perfect opportunity. So this is the shale revolution wasn't taking place. There were practically no LNG in the market. It was like a Russian monopoly taking place, uh, take or pay contracts, etc., etc., etc. And back in then reality, it was seen as a proper plan, like a plan to implement and a success to bring for Germany and for German position within the European Union. But time has flown. And now we are like facing the whole other reality now. But back in 2010, Germans had some serious reasons to believe that Nord Stream 2 uh, ought to be a success story like a Nord Stream 1. Yeah, so thanks uh, for your uh, responses. And again, uh, an incredible debate that was going on uh, in terms of that question. We have uh, approximately eight minutes left. Of course, we can take a few extra minutes if it's needed at the end. Uh, but maybe let's finish our uh, panel discussion with a very interesting question from our Zoom chat. 
uh this is addressed for all the speakers so again uh who will be ready to talk first may talk first uh what may be the worst consequences if russia completes this project successfully and the focus has to be put on ukraine and ukrainian context i'll start if you don't mind sure. uh if this project is completed, Ukraine will be invaded by Russia. No question. They'll finish the job they started, uh, in my opinion. And that's and I, I think that's obvious. This is what they do. If this uh, project is completed, the Russians will continue their military creep in the Baltic Sea. And before you know it, they'll have all kinds of army and navy in the Baltic Sea, just like they're trying to do in the Black Sea with the Sea of Azov and so on and so forth. Uh, and, and I think, I think th those, are the, those are the major consequences if the, if the Nord Stream 2 pipeline is, is complete. So who wants to join the debate? Like, I guess, so like representing Ukraine, uh, I am not skeptical, but I doubt the first invasion of Russia, like coming to other regions like Haki, Odessa, Dnipropetrovsk. But the thing is in which like, I'm sure that the existence of Nord Stream 2 would cause drastic changes in the market, but not like energy market, in the whole power play in the region, because Nord Stream 2 is like more of a weapon and Russia may start the energy blackmail. They may say, okay, we don't need Ukrainian transit and we seize the contract. We don't care that we should like transport the gas till 2024. We decided to seize it because your gas transportation system is old and because our gas like may lose, may lose some molecules due to aluminum of which is based. So like it's maybe, maybe multitude of reasons but no one like may deny the fact that Russians may like just say no to Ukrainian transit. And this would cause like the energy blackmail of Eastern European countries, of Ukraine. So new gas Ukrainian, uh, gas wars of Ukraine and Russia and to what it may lead, I don't think it will lead to some security, military scenarios, but the political instability energy uh, blackmail and the like the whole escalation of the ukraine case which would cause some like more uh, russia centered views or more views of euro skeptical like parties that okay like ukraine has caused this all problems because of its transit why we should defend Ukraine, like why? And these questions of like protecting Europe, protecting Ukraine will come up with a new spirit. So that's why Nord Stream 2 is a dangerous project for European energy security and maybe for European security as well. Mr. Grassel, maybe you will deliver the final point today. <clears throat> well, I agree with my predecessors. So I think Economic pressure is the minimum and invasion is the maximum thing that might happen. Uh, I would, on, the on the war, I wouldn't be apodictive that it has to happen, but it can happen. Uh, and the cost of it would be, would be lower. Uh, Russia will, of course, be more assertive uh, and the risk for escalatory behavior are lower. And so they will, they will try to, to do something. Uh, such things can, of course, be stopped uh, by other means. Um, it's not apodictive that, that once the gas pipeline is down, war will start. That also will depend how the rest of the world uh, reacts and whether we'll have an adult in the White House or not. Uh, so a lot of things may happen, but it's not getting better. Um, uh, uh, that's, that's for sure. So thank you. We have an incredible time in today uh despite our discussion at some moments was spicy and at some point controversial but uh such debate and dialogue is crucial for the real political analysis so thank you for that thank you for your braveness and for your insightful analysis it was such an honor uh <clears throat> and uh 
it was such an honor to have you on uh, this panel and we had an incredible conversation. I hope that our audience enjoyed it as much as uh, the speakers also. Uh, again, uh, we have uh, a huge gratitude for your participation today. Thank you so much. Uh, just a quick reminder that we were talking today with uh, Madam Diane Francis, editor at large of the National Post uh, and senior fellow of Atlantic Council Eurasia Center, Mr. Gustav Grasso, uh, the senior fellow of European Council on Foreign Relations, uh, and Mr. Uh, Viktor Karvatsky, the CEO of Adastra Think Tank from Ukraine. And uh, I, uh, Arthur Koldemisev, uh, the senior fellow of Adastra Think Tank in Ukraine, was super glad and excited uh, to moderate this conversation. Thank you so much one more time. Our audience members uh, can watch this panel discussion later uh, on our social media outlets. So check it out later, uh, maybe today, maybe tomorrow. Uh, you will get the notifications. Uh, thank you one more time. It was super incredible uh, conversation. Uh, and I hope that uh, we've discussed uh, so many important moments today that will spark interest in that topic for many people. Thank you so much one more time. Uh, and uh, we hope to see you in our future events. Thank you. Glad to meet all of you. Thanks a lot for being Thanks. here. Thanks. Good night. Good night. Like you are free to leave, we're now. We're okay, yeah. Uh, like, I, I have to run into another meeting, unfortunately. So, it was a pleasure, and thanks a lot. To next time. Yeah, 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 yeah. Да, я тут можу виключати, да?